welcome to everybody this morning. I see we've got a nice crowd this morning, and uh, I hope we're going to make a very interesting presentation this morning. As you can see on your screens, we're going to be talking about reduced pressure zone backflow preventers. Now, of those of you that are in the Cape area, Western and Eastern Cape, you will have most probably come across these animals already and been having to install them because of the Cape Town legislation. But what a lot of people aren't aware of is the fact that it's actually not a new thing. It's been in SANS 1025 2.1 for many, many years. Just nobody's ever bothered to carry on and to install them. So today what I'd like to do is to have a look and see why we have to put them in and uh, when we have to put them in. And this is the introduction to RPZ valves or reduced pressure zone backflow preventers. And then in the very near future, we'll go in exactly where they have to be installed and how to service them and that type of thing. So today is the basic introduction to the RPZs. So to start off with, we'll have a look and see what is backflow prevention. And we'll see in the definition that is on your screens, you can see it as the protection against pollution of potable water in a water installation system, either within individual installations or from premises to the municipal water supply work. So whether it be you in a house, on your own on the property, or if it is on a complex, no water is allowed to flow back from an installation back into the municipal line. And we'll come to exactly why that is in a second or two. If we just have a quick look and see what the definition of pollution is, what is viewed as pollution, see there it says pollution can be defined as any relative degradation of the quality of potable water. Polluted water is water that is of a lesser quality and that's specified by SANS 251. Now, you may say, yes, but my water came from the municipality. Why can't I just allow it to flow back? The problem is there is no control of your water and what has happened to it after it has left the municipal system. So unless you want to regularly have your water tested, which is going to cost you a lot of money, we need to make sure that nothing flows back to the municipal site. And there's got to be a complete break between the two systems. Now, you may think, now how is that possible? Because I need to get water in, how can I not get it back? Now, that is exactly what the RPZ valve does. It has a reduced pressure zone so that if there is a backflow situation, it goes to atmospheric and it then will dump any water coming back instead of letting it go back into the municipal line. You can see if we carry on with this thing about pollution, it says water which may be obtained from boreholes or other alternative water supply sources such as rainwater and recycled grey water. Now we may understand why rainwater and recycled grey water, because there could be toxins and stuff, acid rain, bird droppings, that type of thing in the rainwater. But I mean, often boreholes are also much cleaner than even the municipal line. Doesn't matter, unless it's actually been regularly tested, you are not allowed to have it flow back. So it's got to be specified and tested to SANS 241 to, make, to allow it to run back again. So when will backflow occur? Now we know, Water will always go from a high pressure situation to a lower pressure situation. So if the municipality, for instance, do maintenance on a line, water can flow back because now the municipal line is a low pressure situation and our installation will be a higher pressure and it's going to try and flow back. That is why we have an anti-siphon loop on our geysers and things like that to make sure no backflow happens there. So it is whenever the pressure downstream is higher than the supply. So we could have it if there's a pipe burst. We know that our infrastructure is failing in South Africa, so that often happens. They put a 
new development up somewhere, but the piping doesn't get replaced. They just increase the pressure and the old pipes can't handle it and they start bursting. But also if there's a fire in the area, there's a large amount of draw off, off that municipal line and the pressure can drop radically. So then there will be a drop in pressure in that area there. Now, for backflow, your different fluids have been categorized into different categories. Now, category one is your normal water, potable water as we receive it from the municipality. It's fit for human consumption directly from the system. Category two is fluid presenting no human health hazard, but the quality of which may have undergone a change and this is the important one, a change in taste, odor, color, or temperature. Now, often people have got water softeners, water purifiers on the system. There we are changing the taste of that water. Every single one of our installations has got a geyser installation. So we are changing the temperature of the water. So any water that is on our premises will be categorized as category two at the best category three is fluid representing some human health hazard due to the presence of one or more harmful substances so this would be where we have swimming pools with a lot of chemicals and stuff in um, fish ponds things like that if we are doing gardening most of our properties have got a garden. So we're putting fertilizer and compost and stuff on the grass. We're watering it. Some of that water can suck back through a hose into the potable system. That would be a category three. Then your category four is your more very toxic substances, uh, carcinogenic substances and so forth. We don't deal with that very much in our normal domestic installations. But those of you that do mortuaries, veterinary services, places like that, definitely. Hospitals must, that is a category four classification. And then category five is your worst one, which has got your effluent and so forth in it, your microbiological or viral elements. So we break that up, the types of fluid categories. And then if we have a look, your different backflow devices have also been grouped in different groups depending on where they will be used. Now, there's eight groups, A, B, C, D, through 2 L. Okay. Usually the ones that we will be dealing with is a BA type, which can caters for all the fluid categories from one to four. So as I say, that is the main one that you guys will be dealing with is your standard BA type backflow preventer. If we go to category five, which then has to have an AA, and that's an unrestricted air gap. So that is where there's absolutely no contact, no possibility of contact between the one installation and the other. So that is the very uh, worst type of installation. I wouldn't say the worst type of installation, but the worst category and the where we've got to take the biggest uh, measures to have safety installed there. Then if we then now go and have a look, is this an option? Is it something that we must do, don't have to do? We go to SANS 102.5.2.1 and you'll see it on your screens there. We go to section 7.4 and then we see that it says adequate measures shall be taken to prevent deterioration of the quality of water in any water installation. So it's not an option. Do it if you want to or anything like that. It says you shall make sure. Okay. Then if we go to 7.4.2 and we have a look at connections, it says no connection shall be made between a general installation conveying water from the supply main and an installation conveying water from any other source of supply. So we are not allowed to have an installation where there's mains and, for instance, a borehole all connected onto one line. There's not allowed to be any interconnection between those two. 
or even rainwater harvesting or anything like that, no connection shall be made between these. And then it carries on a couple of others which are a lot more uh, evident, for instance, between potable water and drain and sewer, things like that. But I think that we're all quite aware of there. Then in 7.4.3, it tells us about prevention of backflow because we've now seen what installations we do not want backflow from. It says, adequate measures shall be taken to prevent back siphonage of water into the following. An installation in all cases where the design of terminal fittings, including any hose bibcocks, lab taps, or movable shower units is such that a hose or any other flexible pipe can be attached to the fittings. So how many of you do not have a hose tap on your property? I think we all have, unless it's a townhouse or a block of flats, but even they would have a somewhere to do the garden. So we have to take preventative measures for backflow on most installations. And then it carries on, obviously, where there are fire hose reels, uh, underground irrigation system, where that can come in contact with, for instance, where you've been putting fertilizer and so forth down. Most of us have got underground irrigation systems with these pop-up rain birds and all sorts of things like that. So once again, definite place where we shall make provision for uh, stopping backflow. And then it says any other fitting where it can provide contact between polluted water and water within the installation. We've seen what is classified as polluted water anywhere where the taste and the temperature has changed. So most of us have got that scenario. Then we see on the next slide, and I'll just wait for it to go through. I see the connection is a little bit slow for some. Yes, there we go. It says in terms of the national regulation, SANS 10252, where it talks about preservation of water and water quality, it says there that reduced pressure zone backflow preventers must be installed, not option, must be installed in any installation where there is a risk of contaminated water or harmful substances being back siphoned or flowing back into a potable water supply line. The regulation says that backflow preventers shall be installed in certain types of installations and buildings, and we've had a look at that, but specifically where we've got medical treatment of people, animals, where there's pharmaceutical or chemical reaction, manufacturing, dairies, nurseries, stadiums, abattoirs, and where you have a combined fire and potable main installation. So let's have a look at your installations. And if yours doesn't fall in any of those categories, you don't have to put a RPZ valve in. But I think you will agree with me that most installations are going to fall somewhere within those categories there. I've made a little summary here on this chart now and it lists all the different alternative water types like your rainwater, groundwater, surface water. And then the next column it says what type of prevention you have to do according to the national uh, bylaws, Department of Water and Sanitation. And then we go through that. But now the last column, I've used Cape Town, City of Cape Town, as an example, we've got to have a look at our municipal bylaws and have a look and see what approval we have. So we don't just have your SANS regulations, we've got to make sure what our local bylaws are. Remember, they cannot take away from SANS, but they are allowed to add to it. So you will see that Cape Town is very, very, very strict. So all of them, you've got to have approval, 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 approval. You cannot just catch up your rainwater, for instance, and use it for even irrigating the garden. You've got to have approval for the installation from the city of Cape Town. So make sure whichever area you're working in, 
whether not just you've got to have an RPZ valve, because I mean, we've established now that according to your national laws, basically everybody's got to have an RPZ valve. But then over and above that, there could be extra legislation from the municipal area that we're living in to actually what we have to do. And it's not just having to put a RPZ valve in there. There is signage that we've got to put up. And yes, I think most of you have now got it on your screens. Here's a little example. So there must be signage on all your main thoroughfares and points of use. So if you've got a, got a tap on a rainwater system, you have to have a sign up there that says non-drinking water in use. Do not drink. And it's in your three main languages, your English, Afrikaans, and an African language. So that nobody can accidentally drink contaminated water. Have to make sure that it is well signposted. Then we can quickly have a look at right in the beginning on the opening slide. We saw what an RPZ valve looks like on your screens now is a typical sequence of installations. You can see there's an isolating valve, there's a strainer, there's the RPZ valve and another isolating valve. But you'll see something else on an RPZ valve. It's not just a non-return valve. In actual fact, inside that backflow preventer are two non-return valves. And in between is where the name comes from, a reduced pressure zone. So that is, if your municipal mains fails at all, it is going to open up that zone in the middle and dump any water that's in there. It's not a hang of a lot, depending on the size of your RPZ valve, but no more than about a cup full of water. Your second non-return valve should stop any backflow of water. But if there is dirt on that seat and anything leaks back, it cannot go back to the municipal line. It enters that reduced pressure zone, which is now opened up to atmospheric, and it is going to leak out the bottom. And that's where you see that tun dish at the bottom, or that outlet with a vent hole on it. Everything that leaks back is going to go out there to make sure that you can see that there is a problem in the installation. Now, you will notice then logically also that we cannot just bury this thing under the ground. It's got to be above ground level so that you can actually see the water discharging from it. But now people might say, yes, but that's a massive chunk of brass and people are going to come and steal it and so forth. So what do we do now? You can build a box over it, but there has to be an outlet pipe from that box to the outside where you can see it. So that if any water is leaking out into the box, it will run out the side and you can again visually see it. Another very important thing on your RPZ valve, as you'll see on the top of it, there are three test ports and that is for maintenance purposes and also to check and see if your system is working. But the methodology about that I will go into in the next presentation. We'll discuss it a little bit more on how to service it and install it and so forth. That then brings me to the end of my presentation and on the next slide that you will be receiving now, you have got my contact details. If any of you have any further questions or you need more specific training and so forth, by all means, give me a shout and we will help you through it. Thank everybody for their participation and being here this morning. As I said, uh, if you think of some questions later or you need help on any installation or site, by all means, you've got my contact details there. Give me a call and we'll be very willing to help and assist you guys. But thank you very much for attending.